Thank you for joining us in the copy room, where you get to listen in on thoughtful, vulnerable, and honest conversations among educators who are as fiercely devoted to this profession as you are. My aim is to serve you well, nourishing your teacher's soul so that you can move through your week with just a bit more to offer our kids than you had before you listened. You're working so hard to take care of our kids. My intention for this podcast, ultimately, is to take care of you. I want to thank Dirt Path Publishing, a small independent publishing house dedicated to publishing works for social good, for continuing to support the production of this podcast. With editing and coaching services for writers, these folks know how to have the hard conversations in service to your best work, and they know how to do it with love. Dirt Path Publishing is also proud to announce the release of my new book, Nothing's Missing, A Year of Reckoning, Release, and Remembering Who I Am, written for anyone struggling to release the burdens of perfectionism and the tyranny of shoulds. For more information, go to NicoleLuciani.com. In the meantime, and always, welcome to the copy room. I know for sure that the timing of Mike Matthews in my life was part of a larger plan. I had gathered all the training for what I was to be before he arrived on the scene, but he's the one who taught me how to cross the finish line. He taught me to strive, to stop playing small, to speak my ideas, even when he didn't agree with me. I look back on some of those ideas and sometimes wish he had also taught me discernment, but those were lessons to be learned in the years to come. With Mike, my job was to learn how to lead a team, how to bring up the best in people, and how to be brave enough to go first. Along with Judy Rosenberg, who I introduced you to in the introduction of Season 1, Mike was my class advisor. As sophomore class president, I loved leadership, I loved activities, and I loved being around adults who believed in me. Did I love the actual learning of school? Not so much. With the exception of writing, academics held very little interest to me, and this frame of mind was affirmed by people in my family and the teachers I had had prior to Mike who lovingly referred to me as a social butterfly, a chatty Kathy, a bit bossy, but charming enough so you don't hold it against her. On days I didn't want to go to school, my mom would let me stay home, and if those days happened to fall on the days there were lunch activities or class meetings, I'd roll in for lunchtime and then head back home. My mom would laugh. That's my girl, she said. So when Mike shared he was starting our school's very first AP class, and he stopped me in the hall one day to ask me if I was going to apply, his face was fairly stricken when I replied, absolutely not. Why not, he huffed. Because I'm not smart enough. You've only seen me do leadership stuff. I'm not smart at school stuff like the other kids. With all due respect, Nicole, he said, I call bullshit on that. And then he pushed a paper application into my hand. I expect I'll see that filled out and in my box by tomorrow. Mike didn't know he should have low expectations of me. It never occurred to him. Even after the class started the following fall, when I was chronically late, he just put my seat by the door. When I would answer, I don't know, to a question he'd pose, he'd reply, well, you better find out. I felt him refuse to lower his expectations, no matter what I did, no matter what work I didn't do. Eventually, I took those unrelenting expectations and stitched together a new identity, one of student. And I watched as Mike coalesced this motley group of kids who'd never really had a rigorous academic experience before into a team of scholars who knew how to ask hard questions, how to write strong arguments, how to believe that we were worth more than we thought we were, individually and as a collective. In second grade, I decided I wanted to be a teacher because I wanted to be someone who was as kind to students as Mr. Harper was to me. In 11th grade, I decided I wanted to be a teacher because I wanted to be someone who reminded kids of their power, their goodness, and their gifts, like Mike did for me. Truth be told, I would have been a teacher with or without Mike Matthews. Truth be told, I would not have become the person I am today without him. This episode is 35 years in the making, and sharing it with you today feels right on time. 
Listen in as we remember that we belong to one another and that there's no such thing as other people's children. So welcome to Copy Room Conversations, Mike Matthews. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you, Nicole. Glad to see you again. Happy to be here too. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we must do the disclaimer that you were my teacher in junior and senior year. And uh, this show or this season is all about paying it forward. And so I knew for sure that you had to be the first guest on this season because if there is anyone who uh, inspired me to be a teacher, it was you and Lee Akins, who we're hopefully going to hear from as well. Great. So mm-hmm. I just um, I want to let everybody know that you uh, you were pivotal in making this moment happen, and so just at the outset, how much I appreciate you. Well, that makes my Excellent. day, and I think if you talk to any teacher, that those are words that uh, go beyond any kind of value. It's incredible. So thank you for saying it. And thank you for saying it in yes, public. Yes, yes, sir. So <laughs> let's start with a little backstory. We all come to this world of teaching with kind of a unique lens. And, and I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about your growing up, particularly any experience in school and how maybe that informed why you chose to be a teacher and maybe even how you think about teaching. Right. Um, so you know that I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, and uh, went mostly to Catholic schools in Little Rock. And um, I never wa- thought anything about being a teacher while I was in elementary school, middle school, high school. It wasn't even on my radar. I would say I, my teachers were okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't. Uh, I did not. Never in high school, at least, and in, in, in those years, I never. Uh, found anyone to change my life, like like uh, like you said there, mm-hmm. and so uh, it wasn't even on my list. And so I was always going to be a lawyer. I mean, I knew my dad's a lawyer, my oldest son's a lawyer. <laughs> it's in my mm-hmm. blood, right? I knew it's what I wanted to be, and so I was gearing for that. And uh, then I got to college and had a professor in college. I did. I took a job doing some research for him. Um, and he, I did some writing for him, and he took me aside and said, "Let's work on your writing, shall we?" <laughs> <laughs> because it, it just wasn't that good. Mm-hmm. And he, this amazing, brilliant man, preeminent, world famous researcher, took the time to sit down with me. He called me a diamond mm-hmm. in the rough, and helped me to just find a way to write. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that was probably the first time I said, "Wow, what a difference a single person can make in a in a." person's trajectory and what a person can do. Um, and then I went overseas. My, uh, there was a campus. I went to school, college for a junior year abroad in West Berlin. And probably the best thing I did was what they called stop out of school for a little bit. And I became a street musician over there. Um, no, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> <it's funny. laughs> yeah, I was uh, played guitar and sang in the streets of uh, West oh Berlin when the wall was up. Wow. And um, made a living, not a good living, but I made a living and had a lot of time to think um, and read. And that's when I first started going, maybe teaching could be something I could at least look at. Then I came back to college. I volunteered in a, in a classroom um, at a local high school, and the rest is wow. history. Wow. Um, and, uh, and then I had a 37-plus year career in public education and loved every bit you of it. You did. And I, my favorite thing about your career is that even when you were no longer technically a teacher, you stayed teaching. Um, you, were all, you always right. had a class. Yeah, Tell so- me about that. Well, I didn't always, but um, when I, while I was a principal, I was a principal of Malibu High School for 11 years, and um, while I was a principal, I taught first period AP U.S. history every day. Wow. Um, and what I always say about that, it did two things for me. One is I, I have loved my career as, an, as a, a school administrator. It gives me great purpose, gives me great meaning. Um, I think I'm doing good for students and for staff. Mm-hmm. Um, but teaching is joyful, mm-hmm. and it brings a lot more joy than a, than a, a career as an administrator <laughs> brings. And so to have that combination of joy and uh, purpose uh, was very powerful mm-hmm. to me. Um, and the second thing it did was it reminded me of two things. One is uh, 
how hard teaching is to do mm-hmm. well. Um, I I never liked taking attendance. <laughs> so when I was a principal telling teachers I need to take attendance, I, I, I could always give the disclaimer, I'm not very good at this, folks. I have to work really hard at it. And... Uh, yeah, um, and and that was good, and and it reminded me how hard it was, and also reminded me just uh, this is what it's all about. This is the hokey pokey, yeah, right? Yeah. This is uh, public education all centers down to the classroom. Mm. So yeah, thanks for knowing that. And it was as a school superintendent, I couldn't mm-hmm. do it. I couldn't yeah. I couldn't find a way to pull it off. But as a principal, That's I did. So lovely. I just love that. And the attendance thing was always my foray too. Mrs. Jones would call me from the attendance office. <laughs> Nicole, where is your? And I have to say, it worked in my advantage in your class because you may recall that you put my chair right by the door because I was always late, and so it worked to my advantage that you were not a timely attendance taker. That's so funny. Yes, I do recall that. And there may have been some uh, benevolent, uh, you know, omissions think, there in the attendance I keeping. I think so. And, uh... I think so. <laughs> I also remember you told a joke about uh, in ideal societies, um, Italians, French, and Germans, I think. Do you remember this? In an ideal society and in a non-ideal society. And in the non-ideals, the Italians would be running the trains, <laughs> as I recall that conversation. I do remember that. I'm not sure you can get away with no, that now. No, I don't now. think you, you know, could. I think in uh... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you and your Italian self, I think you laughed. I sure that, did. That I took, so thanks for. <laughs> I took great pride in that. Um, so tell me. Um, I mean, I agree that that teaching is so joyful. And since I've started working with adults, um, it, it is really important and impactful, and I love it. And it's not nearly as joyful. Um, so how how is teaching strength in different parts of your life, other parts of your life outside of of school? Well, I'd say a couple of things. One, it gave me a deep love and appreciation for teenagers and all that they go mm-hmm. through. You know, I, I was primarily a high school teacher, mm-hmm. and um, you watch people go through all kinds of struggles, and to see people battle that and go through their own um, struggles and you know emerge in different ways, it gave me a lot of appreciation for that. It also made me a, uh, I don't know whether this is a good thing or not, but it made me a more strict parent mm. because I saw that students who, um, I, mean, I just saw a lot of times when students didn't have any kind of accountability in their lives and it hurt mm-hmm. them. Um, and so, and I, I think it's true as a teacher too. You have to at least have some semblance of expectations that students will do well in your classroom. Mm-hmm. Um and it made me, and I, yeah, and you remember, I was not a strict disciplinarian mm-hmm. at all. But I remember I talked to some, when I was a principal, talking to a teacher, who, a newer teacher, and, and I remember a couple of teachers said to me, these students just won't behave in my mm-hmm. classroom. And I go, and I said, hmm, that's, that's a big, that's tough. Why don't we walk around the school a little bit after your class and go visit some mm-hmm. classrooms? And we go to classrooms and see those very same students acting um, perfectly in different teachers' mm-hmm. classrooms. And I go, what do you think the difference mm-hmm. is? <laughs> and they knew it was their own expectations. Mm-hmm. So I'd say it, it um, made me better in, in, in that way mm-hmm. as well. And um, it also gave me a deep respect for other co-educators mm-hmm. and the hard work that they do and everything they bring to the classroom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You started teaching uh, in what year? Uh, I, I did my student teaching in 1984, mm-hmm. and I started at San Lorenzo in 1985. And you were how old? <laughs> uh, 23 years old 23? in San Lorenzo. When I, I know. When you think back, it's just so <laughs> nuts. I was 22. I know. Uh-huh. I just I can't even believe that someone gave us a job with actual responsibilities for children. Um Unbelievable. <laughs> now, it's interesting. I ask your age because you came in, and I think you were only there five or six years, but you and a group of other folks, young teachers like yourself or or kind of a different breed of teacher, really, uh, changed everything about San Lorenzo High School. Uh, and, and maybe you don't see it that way, but at, being a student there and then going back five years later as a teacher, um, the, the shift was palpable. And so I'm wondering take, if you can take us back to your first few years at San Lorenzo and you entered what can only be called a very traditional good old boys club in that social studies department. They may have all been men. Were they all men who hung out in the they B-Hall were lounge? They all yeah. men. All men. And, yeah. and kind of 
old school football kind of guys, right? And you have the advantage of knowing that world and at the same time having this other view of teaching. And, and I wonder, how do you feel like it was that it, you, it was possible for you to breathe these new possibilities into our school? Well, um, I, it's, I, I love hearing that you felt a difference mm. um, over the time because that when you're working on that change, sometimes you don't think the difference is as big as you want or as, uh, as big as perhaps it really is. Um, but it, it was, I mean, the traditional way of teaching, and I, I mean, it, it's still, I think it's still the predominant way of teaching in high schools mm-hmm. today, especially in history departments and, um, and places where content is mm-hmm. king is lecture, mm-hmm. right? It's just lecture. I remember in B Hall at San Lorenzo on Fridays, we break from lecture and you could hear movies in every classroom <laughs> going on with the pro- projectors and all that. I remember um, Bill Lane said to me, I needed his help in the first couple of weeks of um, threading a film projector. <laughs> And he said, Stanford Education School, and you can't even thread a damn projector. I mean, what kind of, what are they teaching you over there anyway? And so, um, but it, it, it was very traditional. A lot of great oh, people, yeah. you know, warm-hearted, yeah, great yeah. people, no, no question for about sure. that. But for me, that change was all about the teachers that came uh, in the year before I was mm-hmm. there, and then the year I came in, we, there were about 12 of mm-hmm. us. And we, you know, we did so much together. We planned together. We talked together. We uh, lamented our challenges mm-hmm. and failures together. And um, we motivated each mm-hmm. other. And many of us still keep in touch today. Mm-hmm. Uh, those were um, um, amazing years. And so it was the idea of putting students first, mm-hmm. right, of, of skills over content, of um, of making it a student-centered classroom. And I think the students responded very well to that. Um, I remember having some students, though, say, can I transfer to that teacher's classroom uh, next door? We don't do any worksheets here. We don't do the questions at the back of the chapter. I'm I'm lost. (laughs) And some of that was my fault for being all over the place, but a lot of it was students, you know, level of comfort with getting outside of that traditional stuff they've been raised their whole educational career on. So, and I, you know, to me, I, I've spent my whole career uh, basing the idea that change will only happen in schools if teachers have common goals, if they're working together, and if they're always trying to mm. improve. Um, and uh, I, I will not say that I was, I, I didn't think I was that successful. I was department chair over at, uh, in the history department there. And there were a couple teachers who I could work with, but it, eh, it, I didn't feel like um, I walked out of there with a total resounding success. Mm. But that may be because in my five years there, I did not give it enough mm-hmm. time. But because change takes takes a lot Indeed. of time. Indeed. And I, and I also think about um, this notion of generative, is that the right word? Generative change, where you're planting seeds that go on to grow far beyond your time. You know, you started the very first AP class that San Lorenzo had ever seen. Today, they're, they, off, they offer nine every year, nine at minimum, sometimes more, including two for Spanish speakers that provide a lane into college to folks who wouldn't necessarily have that lane. And so you think about a legacy, you know, and, and I think maybe we make that into some larger thing that it some like I've donated a building or I've done whatever, but the, the, the legacy that you and those other teachers left there, um, it just went on to grow the most beautiful fruit over the next 10 years after you left. I remember starting that AP US history class and you of course were in that class. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but the stats at San Lorenzo at that time were that 2% of the students went straight to four year college. Um, you know, where, where I was just left at Miracosta High School, it's about 75% uh, went directly to, to four-year college. And um, I thought that, and I had never taken an AP class as a kid. We didn't have them in my high school. But I knew that if you, and I still believe this, if you could expose kids to the level of rigor they're going to find in college and have them do, you know, succeed in that class, they're going to... Um, 
uh, a feel prepared for mm -hmm. the class and do and b actually do well so we did that and you guys were my guinea pigs as i learned what i was <laughs> trying to do in there but um, I, after that, and I don't know if you knew this or not, I became a mentor teacher for bringing more AP classes, not only into uh, San Lorenzo, but into Arroyo mm -hmm. as well. And so I worked with several teachers on, on doing that. And so we could already see that expansion um, at that time. And for me, the entire mindset was our kids were as great as any mm -hmm. kids. I mean, don't I mean don't let our history of uh, kids just going to, to junior college or community college dictate what we can be in the mm -hmm. future. And uh, I think a lot of teachers didn't believe, mm -hmm. didn't believe that our students at San Lorenzo were capable of those great mm -hmm. heights. Um, but they, but you were. And so I think that was a big part of the mindset change. And I did not know about the um, about there being. Uh, nine AP classes mm -hmm. and uh, that now and all that. It makes me very, very happy. But it all started back then. And, and I think you students were hungry mm -hmm. for it. And I think other teachers were mm -hmm. as well. So that's mm -hmm. great. So there's two things I want you to know. One is uh, I just want to make sure that you know Lorena, who was the first of our graduates of uh, San Lorenzo High to go to Stanford. And you felt nervous that maybe you pushed her too hard. I want you to know that not only did she meet her husband there, but now her child just started there this year. And that to me is such a tribute to what you helped us do. And I want to make sure you knew that. Yeah, I follow her on Facebook and uh, I saw that her son uh, went there and I know she's an attorney and mm -hmm. an, ama I mean, an am amazing success story, as so many of mm -hmm. you are. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, I worried I was pushing all of mm. you uh, too mm -hmm. much at mm -hmm. that time. I mean, I don't know if you remember or not, but I gave away my home yes. phone number for you guys <laughs> to call me. And um, uh, was homework due for us on Fridays or Mondays? I can't I remember. I don't know, but I was notoriously late. It was yeah. another one of your benevolent gifts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I remember you calling and Judy mm -hmm. calling and other people calling and just, you know, I pushed you guys. The number, amount of writing you yes. guys did was off the yes. charts. And by the way, you'll hate to hear this, but as I moved uh, on and became more experienced teaching, I figured I could I, I could teach students to write by having them write far less oh than what you gosh. guys Oh, my God. I, I think you guys wrote six essays, five or six essays a week, and I got it down to two wow. uh, by the time I was, uh, you know, 15 years later or something like that. And uh, so, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you know, it's interesting when I think about who taught me to write. It was definitely you. And, that, you know, that's part of it is because, again, this, this – um, there was such a vast difference in teaching quality at San Lorenzo when I was in high school. I feel like I had the best of the best and really the most difficult of the most difficult. But when I think about when I learned to write, it was with you. And I, and I don't know if I needed five or six essays a week, but I, I, needed, I needed the quantity to develop the muscle memory because until then I had none. And so... Don't don't get yeah. too hard on yourself. And you needed the feedback. Yeah. You needed the feedback. And I, you know, I still when I ask what I teach, I, I go, I teach a writing mm -hmm. course and writing and thinking course using U.S. history as a yeah. backdrop. Yeah. Right. Because, I mean, you guys probably thought I knew way more about <laughs> U.S. history <laughs> than I did. Uh, yeah. Um, I was an international relations major. Yeah. Right. So we I never didn't take a single U.S. history course oh in college, gosh. but. I, I've always mm -hmm. loved it. I mean, I um, and I, you know, as you know, you if you want to learn something very well, teach it. Teach oh it. my God, I believe um, that. Yes, and, yes. <laughs> and so, um, but yeah, I, 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 if you ask all my students, I think writing is the number one thing that I uh, taught them, and I think I got better as that as time went on, and. Uh, that's way more of a legacy than knowing when the War of eighteen twelve started. Amen. Yeah. So, do you feel yeah. like? Because I hadn't heard the story about your professor at Stanford taking the time to really teach you how to write. Do you feel like maybe you're part of his legacy? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know if he knows that or not, but he, I, I am. I mean, he, he changed, he changed my success as a as a college student, but also um, gave me a passion for for writing. Uh, you know, he he absolutely. 
um, did that. And so I'm very grateful. Professor Alexander George <laughs> was his name. And uh, he was a preeminent Soviet specialist in the wow. war. And, uh, you know, he would take the time to talk to, you know, insignificant me in, in, in my time. And I, I'm, I'm forever grateful. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, by the way, is the one who introduced me to um, a, a, a still a person, a friend of mine, David Payne, who's, uh, who introduced me to Mary Smathers, who's one of your Gosh, teachers yes. as well. So it's a small yes. world. It's a small world indeed, out there. Indeed, indeed. So let's take a minute to talk about this teacher and student dynamic, right? And I, and I, uh, I, I think back to my years, you know, I taught for 20 years, which is so hard for me to believe, um, and how many thousands of students that was. And there are several who I can look back and feel like, yep, not only did I teach that child, but that child taught me. And that, that relationship was so important. And I, and I remember having time with you. Um, we share um, a, a similar, I think, personality, style, and uh, passion for learning and for other people. But I, I'm wondering, you know, can you look back and think about long-term impact? I can speak specifically to the, your long-term impact on me. But can you look back at any students and think about long-term impact for you that you've carried forward i know you talk about warren and his his grade and his homework um uh, that's definitely something i'm sure carried forward but is there anything else you feel like you're carrying forward from your students yeah i can point to your class and point to a lot of people um uh you know you and judy sat next to each other how do i remember that yeah we did yeah right and um but uh, just um, seeing seeing uh, what went, made the light go on and what made the light mm-hmm. dim, and then the conversations that we had, right? You guys were not afraid to talk to me, uh, and I uh, and I like to think that I try that I tried to invite that, and I heard about what worked for you and what was just killing mm-hmm. you. Um, um, and so, uh, and that was true for so many in the class. Um, you know, Lorena, we mentioned, already mm-hmm. mentioned, and, and Peter, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Peter mm-hmm. Tran, and, and Warren, uh, who already mentioned, and, and so many others in that classroom, um, Rosie. Uh, and just seeing the struggles and then seeing the motivations change and then watching all the success that all mm-hmm. of you had. Uh, that, to me, was remarkable. I can point to a lot of students um, in my, you know, when I was teaching AP uh, history while I was a principal, and I still have relationships with those guys. You know, I have uh, people who are in politics and people who are attorneys, and I still run into people, um, you know, uh, uh, that I haven't seen in a, in a long, long time who, who, who say positive things and, and, and all that. So um, for me, it was just a reminder, um, uh, those, those, those relationships, that all that hard work is worth it. Because sometimes in the moment, um, I mean, I, I, I said it before, teaching is really hard and you wonder what difference you are making and, and, and you don't reach every single student, but you, you do uh, have the potential to do that every single day. And um, that's, what I, that's what I took away from that. Uh, and of all the students I've ever had, Nicole, you're the one that I keep in touch with the most. And to have you teach in my very same yeah. classroom, room mm-hmm. B10, I mean, it was, uh, it's a story... I tell a lot, and uh, you know you've uh, you've lied and said nice things about me <laughs> over the years, and, and 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 that's been great too. And so I've um, I feel very 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 blessed by all the student relationships I've had, and what I, how I've learned so much from all the students. Do you have a, a a lesson that you think back on as one of the most important that a student has taught you? Well, it's not a not a single single story, but um, and it, it, this isn't really a classroom story. But I'll 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 say this. But I've had this experience twenty plus times in my career, where as a, as a as a principal, you you arrange for a parent conference because a student is really not doing well, and maybe that student is you know hurting hurting other students as well, and um, and and really not really you're very worried mm-hmm. about them 
So you call the parent in to really straighten that, you know, get that child back on the mm -hmm. right path. And then you meet the parent and you leave that conversation going, how can this child be as good as mm -hmm. they are? Um, because their home situation is so challenging that it's a miracle they're at school at all. It's a miracle that um, they're not much worse than they are, not, not behaving much worse than they already are at mm -hmm. school. And so my, my takeaway from that is never assume what a student is bringing to the table, mm -hmm. right? They, um, and I was very fortunate, right? I, I was, loved my whole childhood. I, 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 uh, everything was easy for me. I mean, yeah, plenty of challenges, but uh, in terms of having parents who had a high expectations and supported me, that was never my thing. And that is not always true for students. So uh, everyone's going through a lot. Everyone brings their own baggage to the table. And I have had students remind me of that over and over again. And I think we as teachers really need to try to best understand what, what our students are over, trying to overcome mm -hmm. and be that positive force in their lives to help mm -hmm. them do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're going to um, go toward the three questions that we end uh, all of these episodes with. And uh, the, the first one is, what's your, um, there's this song by the Indigo Girls. There's a, a line in it that says, if you have a care in the world, you have a gift to give. And I wonder what your gift is. You know, so many people outside of schools think that there's going to be one answer, right? And one thing. And if we would just do this X, then everything will fall into place. And really, I think you and I know after all of these years that we all have to bring our special gift to the table. I kind of see it like a puzzle piece, you know, to put the puzzle piece down and work together collectively to put this thing together. So if we're going to create a, a, an intentionally collective, interdependent, and healthy system for our kids and for each other as educators, we need to bring our gift to the table. So I'm wondering what, what you think your gift is. What, what do you care about so deeply that it's become your gift? Um, the reason, you know, I, I love teaching. Um, I love being a full-time teacher. But one of the main reasons I went into administration was because I believe, and I, and I was pushed to do that from a very early age, but I believe my gift has always been um, trying to bring people together and move forward mm -hmm. together. Um, and so that's what I focused my, my entire career on. And American education I, I just um, uh, is... Two things about that researchers have found about American education. One is after three years, most teachers stop improving. Mm. The, the amount of learning in the first three years is off the charts. And then after that, you get comfortable and you don't improve that much. By the way, if anyone's listening to this podcast, and um, they're not that group, right? Because they're, <laughs> right. they're the ones seeking, seeking to get better. You, this is the choir we're talking indeed, to right indeed. now. Um, and the second one is that um, Finland, I don't know if you heard, but Finland schools are famous right now for being on top mm -hmm. of the world. And they asked them, how, where did you guys learn all this stuff? And the answer is always American research. You guys have done this amazing research in America, wow. but no one in America pays attention oh to God. it. And so we as American educators typically ignore all the research mm -hmm. out there. And so I, for me, um, that gift that I've tried to bring is pick something. There's a million things you can pick that work mm -hmm. well, but pick something and then work all together to, 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 you know, learn it, practice it, get better at it, and communicate mm -hmm. with that. Uh, that could be professional learning communities. That could be, there's Lauren Resnick's principles of learning. That could be workshop teaching. It could be any, I mean, there's a million things mm -hmm. it could be. Um, but as a school community, pick it mm. and go. And that's what I've tried to do as a principal and as a superintendent is to really try to get that focus mm. going. Um, and because uh, I think that's what we're missing, mm. right? Uh, um, we, we need to break that mold of being uh, 
just a bunch of independent operators trying to survive or thinking that we know enough to survive on our own. We don't. We have to do Mm -hmm. it together. And so that's the gift I've always tried to bring Mm, to the table. I appreciate that. And I think anybody who just heard you offer the word focus, you know, the amount of initiative fatigue that teachers feel like we're going to do this thing, that we're going to do this thing, we're going to like, can we just get do one thing and get really good at it? Like that, that would be such a relief. (laughs) I, I remember as a teacher at San Lorenzo walking into the library for a professional development thing and going, what are we doing today? What's the new topic today? (laughs) And I was, I had a positive attitude. I was always interested, but you got to stick with it for years, years. Has to be the same thing year after year after year. I remember going to a school um, uh, down in Orange County that was working on math reform and uh, they've been doing the same thing for 18 years. And they go, we are just getting started. We have so much to learn. It was so inspiring. It was great. That's amazing. That's amazing. All right. So let's um, well, let's close out. What First of all, what's your favorite song to get ready for a great day in school? You know, you told me you were going to ask yeah. that question. And uh, I'm not going to give you a okay. great answer. I mean, it depends. On, uh, the, I love music. And the kind of music I listen to is whatever kind of mood uh-huh, I'm in. Uh-huh. Right? That's, uh, if, I, if, I, if I'm up, I'm listening to pop punk or, or uh, classic rock and roll. If I'm down, I can listen to, uh, you know, some country or something yeah. like that, whatever the case yeah. may be. Um, but uh, for me, I don't need to get up mm. uh, as a teacher or, or as a principal because every day is a great mm-hmm. day. And I always got a little irked when teachers would tell students, hey, guys, I'm not having a very good day today. So let's kind of just kind of chill and, you know, just stay away from it today. I, I've seen that happen because... Uh, you know, imagine going to a Broadway play and having a, a play play actor say, "Hey, hey, uh, sorry guys, I'm not very up today. We're going to give a, a half a, a half-hearted performance." And so, to me, every day, no matter what kind of mood you're in, uh, it's not the music that gets me going. It's just the fact that students deserve the very mm-hmm. best, and they don't need to know what mm. you're going through. Um, and so, I uh, that's a lousy answer to it's your okay. question, I know. But uh, when I when that bell rings, uh, it, yeah, the, the smile comes out and the focus comes out. And uh, a lot of times, it's totally real. And sometimes it was a little made yeah. up because uh, the students deserve. <laughs> yeah, that. I I remember Pam used to tell me, "Behave your way to success." You know, just um, just get in there and let their energy bring you back to yourself, um, because. They always like did. Like they that. always did. Even in the most trying times in my life, I could go into my classroom and their energy would bring me back to, to myself. And so I get it. I get yeah. it. I, I, I did a lot of teaching for um, some universities and graduate level teaching as a superintendent and uh, for few aspiring administrators. And I remember going to that class at 6 p.m. going, I am so tired. <laughs> I have so much to do. Uh, I, why do yes. I do this? And then I'd walk out of it going, that was the greatest thing I've ever done. I am so happy. I'm fired up. And uh, it's just what yeah. you said. It's just the students will, will bring, that, bring that joy to you and remind you of, of why you're mm-hmm. alive. Mm-hmm. All right. So we, uh, we, we call this podcast the Copy Room Conversations because I, I don't know about you, but I learned so much, probably more than anywhere else. I learned in, in the copy room talking to my colleagues. And so um, just kind of, it's kind of a quick takeaway. Let's imagine we're in the copy room. I'm cutting strips of paper with the paper cutter. You're punching holes in the handout. Someone else is running copies. What's something you can share with us? And that can be light or serious or practical or theoretical that's going to serve us well today. Did you ever get to smell the ditto paper too or not? Yes, I was. Uh, I think, was that nope, after your that time? that was still my time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here, here's what I would do with that. I, I, I would say the Lego movie had it exactly mm-hmm. right in that everything is cool when you're part of a team, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it is, uh, I won't sing it, but uh, you, you can hear it mm-hmm. in your head, right? And um, the best times I've had in life, um, and certainly as an educator, were when I was part of an awesome mm-hmm. team. Uh, I'll go back to our class. We were a team, our mm-hmm. class, right? I've always called AP, AP teaching is like, uh, coaching, coaching a sport, mm-hmm. right? You're all preparing together for this examination that's coming along, and um, and you're not. It isn't me against you. It's all of us together trying to help us be mm-hmm. ready. 
uh, we were a team. Those, that group of teachers, that cadre of teachers you were talking about at San Lorenzo, um, we were a team. I've had so many great teams in my life. And they just, um, you know, they push you to be a better person. They push you to be a better educator. Um, and it's so much mm-hmm. fun, mm-hmm. right? You, you can support each other in difficult times and you laugh a lot mm-hmm. together. So, yeah, follow that mantra, the Lego, uh, <laughs> Lego movie, and um, uh, find that team and uh, be, be grateful for it and make it all happen. Love it. Thank you so much for being with us. Loved it, Nicole. Thank you very much. Great to be with you again. And uh, congratulations on all of your success and keep on doing great things for teachers. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your precious time with us. My hope is it gave you some respite from your worries and some time to remember that we belong to one another and that there's no such thing as other people's children. If you enjoyed the show, please rate, review, and subscribe. These three things make a big difference in our ability to connect teachers to one another in service to each other and our kids. We also want to thank Dirt Path Publishing for partnering with us on this podcast. The mission of Dirt Path is to publish work for social good. They are proud to include copy room conversations under that banner. For more information on coaching and editing services, or if you have a book you want to publish that you know will serve the greater good, visit dirtpathpublishing.com.